Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIA in Dublin. A most sincere welcome uh, to this event today, this webinar on what went wrong with Brexit and what can we do about it. We're delighted uh, most sincerely to be joined by Peter Foster, Public Policy Editor at the Financial Times and former Europe Editor at the Telegraph, who will be a stranger to nobody on the call, I imagine. Peter is going to be talking about the content of his recent book, which is of the same title as this webinar, which is published by Canon Gate, which I can strongly recommend to anybody. Our chair today is Professor Katie Hayward, and I'm delighted that Katie has taken the time to be with us. Katie is the Queen's University Belfast Professor of Political Sociology, working in and on the island of Ireland on topics including Brexit, protocol, the border, and much else. Thank you both to our chair and to our speaker today and for all of our audience. And I'm very happy now to hand over to Katie. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barry. And uh, thanks to, to you and the team for inviting me to chair this session. It's a great pleasure and an honor to um, chair Peter. Um, so I would like also to commend the IIA on the timing of this. Uh, you couldn't get a better speaker. Uh, for the week that's in it. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing what you're going to say, Peter, in relation to your book on what went wrong with Brexit and what we can do about it. So Peter's going to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to Q&A. You can see the Q&A um, function there. Um, please um, type in your question, including uh, your name and affiliation, please. And we'll come to those as soon as Peter's finished his presentation. Um, a quick reminder that the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record today. Um, and you can join the discussion on X using the handle at IIEA. Uh, please tag us in any posts um, um, that you share about the event. So to introduce Peter, um, he is a journalist, author and the public policy editor at the Financial Times in a career spanning um, almost 30 years. He's reported across Europe Asia and the US, and his current brief covers almost, uh, sorry, all aspects of UK policy, including skills, investment, and the implementation of Brexit. His book, What Went Wrong with Brexit and What We Can Do About It, was published um, in September last year. Um, he joined the Financial Times in April 2020 from the Daily Telegraph, where he'd held the position of Europe editor since 2015, focusing on the Brexit negotiations. And I was reflecting, Peter, um, first time I saw you in person, I don't know if you remember this, was at the um, All Island Civic Dialogue in Dundalk in uh, April, May 2018. It seems much longer ago, actually, than 2018. It's been quite a journey since, um, uh, much of which is recounted in your book. And uh, we look forward very much to hearing you talk about that now. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks a million, Katie. Um... You know, that does not seem that long ago, although, you know, here we are on the fourth anniversary. Um, greetings, everyone from Brexit land. Um, the fourth anniversary uh, uh, yesterday, of course, was the moment where the last piece of legal legacy from the 2017 joint report was finally um, cleaned up. Remember that joint report where um, the UK agreed uh, a national alternative solution was uh, found to remain, uh, keep Northern Ireland remained uh, uh, aligned with the European Union. Um, you know, that is nearly eight years ago, four years since we left the European Union. And um, in the 20 minutes that I've got, I just want to talk, I think, a little bit about what went wrong with Brexit, really because I don't think you can have a proper discussion about what to do about it until you've understood why it went wrong and uh, um, why it so roiled um, British politics. And I think, you know, going back to that period, 2018, um, I'd say there were two words that um, sum up the kind of big problem with Brexit. And they were uttered by Boris Johnson at a um, parliamentary uh, or other diplomatic reception for the Queen's birthday. I think he was in the Belgium embassy. And um, someone came up to him and said, um, Foreign Secretary, what about all these complaints for business? What are they going to do about rules of origin? What are they going to do about custom checks? What are they going to do about um, regulatory divergence? What are they going to do about their supply chains that they spent 30 years uh, uh, integrating into Europe? And Johnson's response famously um, in a story that um, was actually printed in the Daily Telegraph and broken by my uh, former colleague James Crisp and myself was, 
as we all know, F business. And I think it's worth um, interrogating, you know, why Johnson said that um, and what it, what it says about the way in which the British political establishment responded to the challenges of Brexit. It wasn't a considered response. It wasn't a, um, a response that acknowledged the complexities of what leaving the single market would mean. It was a expression of um, frustration, an Anglo-Saxon expression of frustration, fundamental incoherence, F business. I don't care. You know, I just want to do this. I just want to be free. I just want to leave. And I think when you apply that filter to pretty much everything that happened next, that's where you end up. So when Parliament tried to stop a no deal Brexit, as uh, Johnson was dicing with the European Commission, you know, Johnson's response was F Parliament. He tried to prorogue it. And when the judges ruled unanimously that the prorogation was illegal, the response was F the judges, F the judiciary. And, you know, that, I'm afraid, kind of speaks to the fundamental incoherence of the British state's um, response to the um, to the Brexit conundrum, which was fundamentally um, complicated. I think it also speaks to the fact that, and you see this even now, Boris Johnson um, talking in a tweet uh, after the DUP deal uh, uh, that came out yesterday, that we mustn't let the tail wag the dog. We mustn't allow us to be creeping into alignment with the European Union because we need to seize the deregulatory benefits of Brexit. And as I outline in the book, you know, that is born of a sort of mythical view that somehow the UK was this hyper competitive, innovative economy that was being uh, held back by the sclerosis of uh, the European Union. We were famously shackled to a corpse uh, and that somehow by being outside the European Union, we would benefit from being nimbler and uh, quicker and uh, um, uh, you know, more innovative. Of course, the truth is that um, that view of the world fundamentally failed to understand what the Lisbon and Maastricht treaties had done, what had happened to supply chains as they'd integrated uh, over the 30 or 40 years since the UK had joined the EU. And that basic understanding is still not really filtering into um, the public discussion of Brexit. You've still got Johnson and Frost saying we need to cling to this idea that there's a deregulatory um, crock of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, and I think you know that that brings us to the kind of other the big other big misunderstanding about Brexit, which was that. The UK was much more deeply integrated into the EU than the political and public conversation um, had admitted. And so what you find now is that not only do uh, uh, as British trade suffered significantly as a result of um, the borders that we erected, the reverse trade deal that we effectively did with our largest market. I mean, extraordinary to step back for a minute and think that the same people who were arguing that buccaneering Britain would prosper by lowering trade barriers with distant trade partners by doing trade deals with India and Australia and New Zealand would at the same moment raise trade barriers with the market that took half our trade. In fact, a market that third quarter of 2023 took 53% of our trade, not because trade is booming with Europe, but because um, actually we've struggled to grow our trade with the rest of the world, uh, particularly as you know, actually trade is regionalizing at the moment. All that uh, business about not nearshoring, but that that parenthesis aside, what what you see is a slow dawning, and this is I think reflected in the um, uh, public opinion polls, which show British opinion souring on Brexit. But a slow dawning of how actually um, life is much more complicated and much more integrated than um, the original sort of political pitch, economic pitch, uh, Sonny Upland's pitch for Brexit admitted. And I'd say that the next piece of that puzzle is understanding that um, if you look at the trade surveys, understanding that um, that pain increases over time, that there is a, a baked in structural uncertainty as a result of the UK's uh, relationship with the EU post-Brexit. So 
in the old days, of course, regulation came much, which that we gold plated. Regulation came down the pipe from Brussels. Uh, it was enacted into UK law. Business often complained about it, but it was the uh, a route by which um, business access to common market of 500 million people. What we see now, of course, is what I call Brexit 2.0 issues, where actually the European Union is regulating on you know, carbon border taxes is a good is a good example, supply chain due diligence, plastic packaging uh, uh, taxes, and what you see is that business is consistently saying that actually trading with Europe is getting, if anything, harder, not easier, and I think that also hasn't been fully internalized that every turn of the regulatory wheel in Brussels poses a question in London and the horizon scanning that's required in London to make a decision about where you um, effectively align, bearing in mind that alignment doesn't get you access or where you diverge um, creates um, a huge amount of bandwidth problem for, for the, the British civil service and for businesses that are scanning the horizon and trying to make decisions about where they want to uh, invest. And so when you add all that together, I don't think it's entirely surprising that um, Brexit has uh, uh, damaged uh, uh, the UK's trade. It, our trade intensity has been, which is a, 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 a portion of trade relative, uh, exports, export, exports, imports added together as share of GDP is the lowest in the G7 since Brexit. Um, you know, you, you see a, a, a dawning, I think, um, uh, among the public that uh, Brexit has actually uh, made things more expensive. It's made it harder to get stuff from Europe. Um, it has uh, raised the cost of living. It has uh, uh, um, made the NHS less uh, um, robust than it was, harder to get um, skilled people. Uh, and I think that, you know, has opened the door uh, going on to the what to do about it has opened the door to um, a new government that doesn't carry um, the same baggage uh, as this government um, to try and reopen uh, the discussion with Europe. Now, if the opinion polls are to be believed, that it will be, of course, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, the, uh, uh, the head of a Labour government with a majority, depending on which polls you believe, but a, a, probably a re relatively decent sized uh, majority. Now, Starmer has said that he uh, uh, won't rejoin the uh, EU single market and he won't join the customs union. And so, you know, if you plug those two red lines into the uh, machine in, in the European Commission and you wind the handle, what drops out the bottom is something very like the trade and cooperation agreement, which Labour um, uh, uh, likes to uh, deride, the deal that Boris Johnson signed. So the question I ask in the book is not whether the UK should rejoin, but it's what can you do within the uh, within those parameters um, without um, being overly cakeist. And I think um, Labour will look to do um, uh, two or three things. The first thing they will do, um, bearing in mind what's happened in the decade since we voted to leave. So if you, you know, clearly look at, at Ukraine, the European security problem, you know, it's potentially possible that we'll have Donald Trump in the White House. The, the entire framing of the EU-UK relationship and the differences between London and Brussels. Leave aside the, the process that, that happens in the Commission. The macro framing of that relationship will be different. And I think Starmer is committed to trying to make a, a big diplomatic play that the UK, under his leadership, doesn't want to be a zero-sum player. It wants to be a strategic partner in Europe. Now, we saw last year, didn't we, that even where there's a mutual strategic interest, for example, on uh, adjusting the, the EV tariffs, uh, as part of the TCA, but from March or April, it was clear that industry on both the EU and the UK side didn't want to have a situation where 10% tariffs were going on electric vehicles when we're all trying to get strategically less reliant on the Chinese. Nonetheless, it took until December to get a deal. Now, I think what Starmer will try and do is reframe the discussion about um, the EU-UK relationship and say, actually, we don't want to be in a zero-sum relationship. We want to be 
strategically part of Europe, and that's a security offer. So not just on Ukraine, but also on the Balkans, etc. But then I think a wider play that looks at energy and net zero. So Starmer could look, for example, to link the UK and the EU carbon markets. That would avoid um, the barriers put up by uh, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, but also would be a statement of his commitment to um, looking at the neighborhood in a strategic way. I think um, mobility is a, a big area where you know, uh, the rubber really hits the road for a lot of ordinary people. Our young people uh, on both sides of the channel can't be au pairs in each other's country. There's no exchange program for apprenticeships and, apprenticeships and visas. It's difficult for um, young people to go and work, uh, uh, young, young Europeans to go and work in the UK and vice versa. My son actually at the moment is doing a um, ski season on his year off in the Alps, and all of his colleagues, all the saisonaires, most of the foreigners are um, uh, Australians and uh, Canadians, because I think France has a mobility, youth mobility deal with those countries. It's easier for an Aussie to go and work in France than it is for a young Brit. And I think, you know, that central conceit of Brexit, that somehow we should treat everybody equally, regardless of the fact that the EU is in our neighbourhood, I think will be unpicked by Starmer. I think he will look to do a, uh, um, a mobility deal. And it's possible that that deal will be relatively deep. Uh, some of the suggestions that are being kicked around the European Commission at the moment um, suggest that it doesn't seem impossible that you might get some professional mobility. Now, that's different from mutual recognition of professional qualifications. But I think you can see a world where a, a, a strategic play by the Brits to um, get everybody back in the room and rethink the relationship um, and bleed that security strategic offer into other areas like energy, um, uh, energy security and energy co uh, connectors, um, the regulation, for example, of um, pharmaceuticals in a, in a world where we're suffering from pandemics. I think that is the kind of thinking, the space that Labour are in. Now, of course, the difficulty is migrating that into an iterative negotiation in the European Commission. Obviously, the bureaucracies on both sides are deeply scarred. Um, it's not just the European Commission that's scarred by butting heads with David Frost and Boris Johnson. The UK bureaucracy is pretty scarred by butting heads with the European Commission. Uh, and of course, um, you know, the Labour Party is probably still internally guilty of various pieces of cakeism. But I also think that if you allow um, the, uh, uh, the last 10 years to be the benchmark for the next 10 years, to be the template for the next 10 years, none of us are going to get anywhere. And, and the hope, I think, is that the geopolitical situation is going to put the EU-UK differences in some considerable perspective. You know, it's not that long ago that uh, uh, Marine Le Pen was talking about Brexit. You don't hear that now. I think, you know, the European uh, Union, for all its internal problems at the moment, um, can uh, uh, engage with the Brits uh, in a way that is different, if it wants to, than uh, it was last time round. Um, some of that, you know, and in the book, I go into you know endless you know, what I call the nitty gritty, where when you add all that stuff together, you start to um, at least build a platform that um, brings the EU and the UK back into a kind of a much more cooperative space, and um, that I think is Labour's intention. I think it's perfectly possible that it runs out of steam, that the European Union finds it easier as it always has in the past, to hide its own differences by essentially taking a, what I call a highest common denominator negotiating approach. I hope that doesn't happen. It's gonna take um, political and diplomatic leadership on both sides to seize the inflection point that will, I think, come from the election in Washington and from the election uh, in London and from the elections in, um, in, in Europe. You know, when you add all those together, I think 2025 will present a moment at which um, the kind of the really macro damage done by Brexit um, 
can start to be undone and we can start to move back to a more symbiotic, less um, uh, abrasive uh, uh, approach. Now, of course, that's not the single market. That's not um, uh, the customs union. Who knows where that process leads? But I think you have to start somewhere. And, you know, I'm relatively optimistic uh, in the sense that you can already see um, outside the Johnson Frost um, sort of semi-fancy world that they cling to this vision of Brexit that they that they originally advanced. You can see a kind of exhaustion developing. And we've seen this week, you know, it's just, it's amazing how you get there in the end. The deal with the DUP, ultimately the Windsor framework, but with a lot of assurances. I mean, the British government felt it didn't need to go and negotiate it with Brussels, which kind of told you the extent of that situation. The introduction of the border uh, controls um, between EU and GB will, I think, start to level the playing field and make it realise that this is a, a mutual game of hurt. Some of the charts in the command paper, which pointed out how much friction Ireland was going to suffer vis-a-vis -vis, um, Northern Ireland traders. OK, I get that that reassures Northern Ireland DUP and, and unionists about unfettered access, but we've come to a funny old place when a British government is somehow celebrating um, border frictions with Ireland as some kind of Brexit win. And so I think under Starmer, he will look to do a veterinary deal. He will look to, I think, link our carbon markets. Some of those problems, some of those frictions will be uh, uh, diminished and massaged away. And, and that, I don't know where that road leads, but I think it leads to a better place than we've been in the last um, uh, 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 nearly 10 years since we voted to leave. Thank you.